You can go out and see blooming plants, blooming wildflowers from March through into November. Into November. Uh, just a steady progression of different species. Um, many of them, most of them perennial species. And if you garden in a sunny uh, site, whether it's dry or wet, uh, there are species that were native to these grasslands that you should consider uh, putting in your yard. These are, uh, there's a lot to choose from. And there's growing interest and growing availability uh, for seeds and plants at these, uh, many of these prairie plants. Um, that sort of illustrates what things were like at one time, not just in the grasslands, but our open woodlands, uh, our wetlands, other habitats. Very diverse, many, many, many species of flowering plants. Uh, unfortunately, in our landscapes, with some exceptions, hopefully you all are, are the exceptions, but we see very little diversity. Uh, this was the uh, first house that I bought in Little Rock. And it had uh, kind of a winter uh, in the middle. Ah. You know, you got your Bradford pear tree, right? <laughs> Anyone has one of those? You got a forsythia, right? A couple of little elm trees they planted in the street. You got a lawn of uh, St. Augustine or Bermuda grass, or centipede grass, or zoysia or something. Usually one species. Um, not, nothing's flowering. You know, this is kind of how it looked when I got there. About the uh, second week we were there, once we had the furniture in, I got the chainsaw out and took the pear tree down. And uh, my wife was berated by the neighbor while I was at work. And they explained that uh, we had other plans. Um, you know, you can put as many species as you have room for. But uh, I created a kind of a plan to have something blooming from, like in these prairies, using these prairie plants, from March with the violets and the spring beauties and the bluets and stuff, all the way through in, with the gentians and the sunflowers into the, the late fall. And I um, was interested in having pollinators, insects. The last talk uh, went into that quite a bit. Um, it ended up planting about 200 species on that property uh, over the course of about six years, or seven years I lived there. Um, I'm going to kind of go into some of these species that I chose. I want to give you first a little background on plant diversity in Arkansas, what we know. And every year we find more species that, that weren't known to be in the state. But um, got about uh, 2,900 different kinds or species of plants that are here persisting, spreading outside of cultivation. So not including things that are being maintained in gardens, but including the native species and those that were brought here and have escaped, become part of the wild flora of the state. Uh, about 21.5% of those are considered to be introduced in recent times since Europeans settled here, uh, since global trade began to take off. Some of these were brought on purpose, others were brought by accident. Some of these are harmless, you know, long weeds. Others are uh, very severe invasive species that are displacing native flora, that are causing economic uh, and ecological problems, uh, every, everything in between. And then that leaves about 78.5% of our flora considered native here. Of the native uh, component, about 525 are considered to be of conservation concern. These have declined dramatically from their pre-settlement or, or from their historic levels. Uh, in some cases, they're missing entirely now, uh, believed to be lost from the state uh, or extinct in a, a couple cases, perhaps. Uh, the things we know are here that have declined, and those are ones that the Natural Heritage Commission is interested in knowing about and protecting. And also, some of them uh, can be helped by gardeners. And I'll talk about a few of those. 
So I like to look to these native ecosystems to get ideas about companion planting, uh, get ideas about um, what would work well in a certain site. If you have real dry, exposed, south-facing slope with uh, clay or shale outcrops, hard to get anything to grow. There are native plants that love that habitat. That is their uh, preferred habitat. If you've got a real boggy, shady area that has uh, you know, you're having trouble figuring out what to grow. There's a native plant that loves that habitat. It's all about matching the species to your site. And um, that can be tricky, but it, it can be done. And almost the entire state was occupied at one time by native plants. So whatever site you've got, there's something for it. Uh, neat thing about the prairies and, and other types of grasslands is they're all fire adapted. So fire was a natural and necessary component of these ecosystems. A lot of them would burn through in the summer or fall. Everything would be above ground, would be consumed. And everything's adapted to this in these ecosystems. And beginning the next year, the first things to bloom are very low to the ground, a few inches tall. As you move through the year, each successive group of plants that blooms is taller than the last. So by late April and early May, you have all these knee-high plants blooming. By midsummer, waist-high, chest-high. By late fall, the big sunflowers, the big blue stem grass. Uh, a lot of these taller plants blooming up to six, seven, eight feet tall. And then sort of can be reset in the spring and started over um, you know, with those low-growing uh, plants. Of course, it does this to get light, to get resources. Uh, the next group of plants gets taller than the last to get back up into the sun. Um, I view my perennial beds the same way. At the end of each year, I'll clean them out, uh, let them start over uh, using these same groups of plants. And sort of back to that thing about fire-maintained woodlands and prairies. Um, much of the plant's actual biomass is underground. These rootstocks go down deep, uh, growing points in a lot of species below the soil. And um, so we're talking about a perennial system here, uh, primarily. Where were these grasslands? Well, we have some great historical uh, data from the original land survey, which began in East Arkansas uh, after the Louisiana Purchase actually started right here for the entire Louisiana Purchase. And um, they surveyed, excuse me, there, and they surveyed uh, north and, and east across the baseline here, uh, west across the baseline, and documented, uh, they walked a mile by a mile grid over all of Louisiana Purchase and documented in detail the vegetation that they encountered. These black areas were mapped as treeless prairies in the early 1800s. The largest in East Arkansas was the Grand Prairie, about half a million acres of, of open grassland, plus much uh, larger area of open savanna and woodland. Uh, space between the trees, diverse carpets of grasses and wildflowers, all fire maintained. Uh, the second largest prairie area, probably out uh, <coughs> Cherokee Prairie out by Fort Smith and, and Charleston. There were scattered prairies across the Ozarks, concentrated around uh, Fayetteville and Rogers, Siloam Springs. There were blackland or base-rich limey prairies across the Blackland Belt of uh, southwestern Arkansas and uh, other scattered prairies across uh, southeast and, and north Arkansas. And those are just the big ones that were really you know, obvious in the map. Uh, but it wasn't that the prairie plants were confined to those black areas. Most of the upland parts of the state historically were much more open than they are today. They did have trees, but the trees were widely spaced. A lot of the ridges were open. Uh, Again, because primarily fire was a very natural and widespread phenomenon. And uh, those prairie plants occurred over a much larger area than they do today. Um, other changes in the landscape and how we use the land have affected the native flora. Um, even areas that were prairie historically, uh, if they're grazed very heavily over long periods of time, the native flora is grazed out, uh, the seed bank is exhausted, a lot of 
pasture land was converted from the warm season plants of the prairie. Uh, most, you know, the prairie is dormant in the winter. Our native uh, grasslands, there's nothing green in this time of year. Uh, so people that are interested in, in raising cattle or other livestock oftentimes converted the natural vegetation over to have something green like fescue or some of the bluegrasses green during the winter time to have forage year around. Um, this is an area that the Natural Heritage Commission acquired. It's a, a prairie remnant in, uh, near Arkadelphia called Turnoir, black soil, black land. And uh, it looked like this when we bought it. It had been grazed heavily for a long time. Also had a lot of cedar trees in it. But it had never been plowed. So that native seed bank had not been grazed to the point it was exhausted. It was still present in the soil. You can see a few scattered prairie plants. Uh, removed the cows off. Uh, this is a fence line, obviously. Uh, cut the cedar trees off. Burned it a couple of times. And we got uh, that dramatic response that you see there with, again, hundreds of species uh, on one side and lacking the other. We have since purchased this piece. I had fescue planted over the top, but again, still had native prairie flora hanging on, and we've uh, been restoring it over time. Uh, about three years in, it's starting to look pretty good. Um, this is pale purple coneflower, Echinacea pallid. Excellent, long lived perennial, very drought tolerant, um, very low maintenance in sunny spots. Has to be well drained, doesn't like it wet. It's in all of our native prairies. It's a very widespread in native woodlands, very thin soil uh, sites. It's okay. Um, there are other species of coneflower, echinacea, that I mentioned in the, in the handout that do well in shaded or moist sites. Uh, this one is a great one uh, for pretty much anywhere that's, that's dry and sunny. Uh, this is a shot of Baker Prairie a little later in the season. You can see the coneflower. Uh, there, the uh, pink, the hot pink is something called wine cups. It's a poppy mallow, the genus Calaroe. Uh, it's in the handout. They look like little cups of, of wine sitting out with this deep sort of burgundy uh, red color. Uh, and the tall plant that you're seeing coming up here is compass plant, Silphium lacinatum. Silphium is a relative of sunflower. They're tall plants. They have large or yellow flower heads. Similar to sunflowers, you can have a hundred on a stalk, and they bloom for a long period of time. Very drought tolerant. Uh, they'll get about five to eight feet tall, depending on the soil fertility of your site. Uh, excellent back of the border uh, species in a sunny zone. There's a natural habitat that's of great conservation concern and of great botanical interest called the glades. Glades are naturally treeless openings in a forested uh, landscape where bedrock either outcrops or comes very close to the surface of the ground. They're basically small, mini desert environments. They have a lot of the dry prairie flora, and then they also have true desert plants like you get in, in, the, in the southwest part of the state. Uh, glades are classified based on the type of bedrock that they form on. And in this part of the state, we have sandstone glades, which are uh, low pH, they're acid. We have uh, shale glades or shale barrens, right around this area in particular, uh, the counties that you all are here from. And sometimes they have a high pH because they have limestones interbedded in the shales in some of the shale formations. Others are acid. Uh, we have novaculite, which is a, a rock type that occurs very few places in the world, primarily in the Washita Mountains. That's the uh, it's a chert-like rock, high in silica. It's the one they make whetstones out of for sharpening tools. You're familiar with it probably if you live around here. Uh, there are glades that form on evaculite, and because it is a rare rock type, uh, there are species that occur in these novaculite glades and in the shale glades that occur nowhere else in the world. Uh, some of them are known from just a handful of places. Uh, only in Arkansas. Uh, I'll talk about a few of those. One of my favorite places in the world is Middle Fork Barrens Natural Area. That's a, a site that we uh, own and manage. You, I should say, you own and we manage. 
Uh, it's just on the eastern edge of Hot Springs Village. Uh, it's one of the most botanically diverse pieces of land in the state. It's only 136 acres. It has somewhere between, I, haven't, I need to get a, a recent tally, but somewhere between 650 and 700 species of, of plants on, on that land, uh, which is a very high number. You know, that's twice what you'd find on any given piece of land that size. And it has uh, some of the highest concentrations of rare species anywhere in the state. And it's one of only two places in the world where this one uh, particular plant occurs. But it's absolutely spectacular. If you go out there in uh, May or, or June or late <coughs> April, you'll see it, is, it, it looks artificial. It's really impressive. Uh, Savannah is another in interesting habitat that's declined dramatically. These are the areas with these open grown uh, old oak or pine trees, widely spaced with a prairie underneath. Uh, fire maintained, converted since to other uses. I should mention that our native prairies, uh, over 99% of the native prairie that was here 150 years ago has been destroyed. Uh, in some regions of the state, it's 100%. In other uh, areas like the Grand Prairie, the biggest area of prairie, 99.9% .9 of the native grasslands have been destroyed. So with it, we've lost a lot of our bio biological diversity. Uh, I mentioned that the woodlands also were more open. This is what a typical Washita Mountain or Ozark uh, woodland would have looked like in times past before the fire suppression uh, Smoky Bear era began. Very open with a continuous carpet of perennial wildflowers and grasses. Uh, a lot of stuff blooming. If you take one thing home from my talk, other than all the plants you could put in your yard, take away this, that um, we've lost our open habitat our native, with, with native species. Of course, we have pastures. Of course, we have uh, agricultural fields and openings and so on. But we've lost that natural open structure of most of, of our habitats with all the native plants uh, in the understory. And with that, we've lost things like quail. We're seeing them decline dramatically. All manner of grassland bird species have declined. Many insects, uh, certain species of reptiles, amphibians, small mammals. We've lost a lot of our biological diversity because those species need open habitat and we don't have it. You'll see a lot of this today. You'll see big trees that have an open growth form in the woods. You walk walk around some of these forested ridges, you'll see these big old trees that did not grow in a dense competition with other things. They grew open. And then underneath you see very dense uh, growth of small trees. Uh, contrast that to this open park-like stand here. Uh, this is an aerial photograph looking down from an airplane. What you see here is taken in the winter, and it's an infrared uh, film. An infrared film is neat because it, if there's something green and growing in nature, it shows up as shades of pink or red in the area of an infrared uh, photograph. And uh, you can see here there's stands of pine trees. Uh, the dark gray is oak forest, oak woodland. Uh, those are individual trees you're seeing here. And the white is native warm season prairie vegetation, grasses, uh, and dormant wildflowers in the wintertime. So this is the kind of what you kind of get an idea of what things were like when there were open habitat conditions. Uh, areas of open prairie, areas of open savanna and woodland. There were dense forests, but they primarily occurred down along streams. They occurred on north facing slopes where it's a little cooler and more moist. Fires were not as intense, fires were not as frequent. Um, this wonderfully diverse landscape is on Camp Robinson military uh, base. You may want to guess why they have this wonderful uh, oak woodland savanna complex? I heard it. They don't do anything to it. 
what have I been talking about? The big process that keeps things fire. There's a there's a mortar range right here. So through their train military training activities, they start fires pretty regularly, and that burns over this particular area of the base. They get fire lines around it, and uh, you know that's a, a safety concern, of course, but it's also maintained all the way into the present a spectacular uh, diverse wildlife area with incredible flora. And it's, it's areas like this that are kind of unique today. Uh, this is part of a study that I've been working on for the last decade or so in the Ozark National Forest, where we're comparing um, unmanaged stands that are just left alone with oak woodland restoration stands, where we go in, uh, thin some of the trees out, and apply fire to the landscape. Nothing's planted. This is all just uh, restoration and management with what's there at the site. Um, in the um, unmanaged stands, they typically look like this, like you're used to seeing in kind of unmanaged woods. On the ground, this is a one square meter plot, it's a permanent plot that we sample every few years. Um, you typically see about five species on average. And they're all, or almost all, I shouldn't say all, almost all shade tolerant woody plant species. There's a sassafras seedling there, there's a hickory seedling. Virginia creeper, poison ivy, uh, a lot of poison ivy, as you can imagine. Um, you know, a few other things, but, but not very high diversity. And another thing to notice, none of these species are flowering. None of them are making fruit. They're just waiting for release, for more light to come in. Uh, you know, even the poison ivy is not flowering or, or setting fruit down on the ground. And there's a dense, thick layer of of leaf mulch that's gathered there over decades. Um, things can't germinate and grow up through that. And uh, this is the same uh, mountainside across a road, this a fire break. Um, some of the trees have been removed, and then it's been burned only three times in this photograph over maybe a decade. Fifteen species average per meter square on the ground. And they're not these shade tolerant plants. They're uh, native sunflower, uh, woodland sunflower is the dominant species here. We've got um, all kinds of um, native grasses, native legumes, which are very important wildlife food species, and a lot of species that flower, a lot of species that set seed and fruit. There's great cover for, for wildlife there. Um, the backbone of all of these ecosystems, at least the food chain, was the plants, of course, and then it's the insects. Insects, most species, or many species, need a nectar resource, flowering plants. Um, they don't get that here. You know, some species that eat leaves, stem borers and things that can, can live in these, uh, subsist on this, but many species need that, that flowering resource. And of course, the more insects you have, the more food there is for everything else. Now, that is what I call a woodland ecosystem. These are upland sites, relatively dry, um, we're more open historically. We did have dense forests, but as I mentioned before, it was mostly in the mountains, at least located uh, down in stream valleys on north or east facing slopes, where it's cooler and more moist. And there are flowers in, native to those kinds of forests, but they're very different than the woodland flowers, which are the warm season species that eat sun, the prairie species, really. In these dense uh, forest uh, communities, you have a lot of spring ephemerals. These are the wildflowers that, and the grasses, really, that grow, uh, do most of their photosynthesizing early in the season, before the hardwood trees leaf out. So uh, come March or April, you'll see all these things begin to bloom. The trilliums, the flocks, um, a lot of the lilies, the dog-toothed violets, the violets, a lot of things in these communities, and they all do their thing before, when there's still light coming in through the, the leafless hardwood trees, and then uh, they slow down once the trees leaf out. They'll set fruit, they'll stop their growth, or at least slow it down dramatically. Many species will disappear by the end of May or early June uh, and come back next year. Other species will hang on, but they'll just kind of hang, hang out there. 
So very different habitats. Shade garden versus a sun garden. Um, we're very interested in wetlands. Very important for biological diversity. It's so Lawrence Creek Natural Area. It's another one of the Heritage Commission properties south of Little Rock. <clears throat> Extremely diverse groundwater fed swamp system. Groundwater is very important. If you have uh, a boggy area on your property where groundwater seeps up, might be a challenge for some things, but it, there's wonderful native plants that would be at home there. If you don't have one, like I don't, I live up on top of a, a really dry, rocky sandstone ridge in West Little Rock, um, you can build a wonderful little bog uh, garden. Easiest thing is to go buy one of those little preformed plastic ponds, drill your holes about in the side walls, four or five holes, halfway up, three quarters of the way up, fill it full of peat, sand, uh, keep it wet in there. You can plant all kinds of native bog plants or seep plants. And these are called seeps because the groundwater literally just seeps all the time up through the soil. Primarily found in the Washita Mountains in Arkansas, also in the Gulf Coastal Plain where you have sand on top of clay, water moves through the sand on top of the clay, and where that contact comes out of the, of the ground, down slope usually, that water comes out. And the coastal plain, they're often called bay heads, and that name comes from this wonderful native shrub or tree, the sweet bay magnolia, it's a semi-evergreen, has a white undersurface to the leaf, uh, thick leathery leaves, beautiful big magnolia flowers, uh, occurs pretty much only in this habitat. We have plants that are endemic, which means, in botanical speak, it means restricted to. So we have plants that occur only here. I mentioned a few in the Navaculite Shale Glades. This is just a few examples. This particular one right here is the Washita Blue Star. A few years ago, it was uh, North, American, North American Perennial Garden Association Wildflower of the Year. It's becoming very popular in the trade. It's very spectacular. It makes a large, kind of bushy growth form. It turns a beautiful golden yellow color in the fall. It has these light blue flowers, really interesting uh, green bean like uh, seed pods on it. Uh, it's just a spectacular uh, plant. We like to work with the seed bank where we can. Uh, if you have a piece of property that um, was looted recently, uh, as, as many people do uh, in this part of the state. You might have a lot of natives already on your property that you can encourage and not have to you know, necessarily bring in from seed. <clears throat> there are a lot of wonderful native grasses. You start reading about prairies, you'll hear people talk about the big four, the big four prairie grasses. These are the dominant um, four grasses over most of the grasslands in the central and eastern parts of North America. They are switchgrass, Indian grass, big blue stem, or turkey foot, and little blue stem. They all have nice ornamental potential. Some other grasses, uh, eastern gamma grass, don't have a really great picture of it. Large fountain-like uh, foliage leaves that arch over, forms a large clump has uh, tall spikes with uh, really interesting uh, flower parts. Sorry? I can't, what is it again? Eastern gamma grass. Uh, the female flower parts are like purple feathers that hang out. They're real feathery, bright purple. Uh, it's hard to, you know, it's not a great picture, but. And then the stamens here, bright orange, dangled down. It's, it's actually really showy, more showy than most grass species. And if you have a really wet site, this grass here is uh, prairie cord grass. Is another one for that. And then if you, in the wet areas of our open habitats, we get some beautiful species like the spider lilies. We have two species. Flowers will be about um, four to six inches across. Uh, we have one that blooms in the early spring, which is this one, and another one that's taller and blooms in the summer. Hymenocallus is the genus. There are a number of species of liatris, or blazing star, gay feather, there's a number of them. We have two species of Indian paintbrush. 
This is a really neat plant here called sensitive briar. It has these, uh, oh, they're about as big around as a quarter. They're little spherical balls of hot pink uh, flowers with brilliant yellow uh, dots out of the tips. Uh, it's called pink puffball. We have about uh, I think seven species of echinacea, about 16 native milkweeds, very important insect species. Milkweeds. The monarch butterfly is in great decline. You may have seen news articles in the last month or so. Um, I think about half the numbers have been seen in their wintering grounds as they've, as they've had in the last decade. And one of the major uh, causes for decline is a decline in milkweed species. That's their host plant. They have to have milkweeds uh, in the genus Asclepius or Metelia or Cymancum uh, in order to uh, make it through the caterpillar stage. And uh, with all the habitat destruction, changes in agricultural practices, especially the uh, Roundup Ready crops in the Midwest, they've lost milkweeds over very large uh, areas. And so planting them in your garden is really important. Uh, if you want monarchs, plant milkweeds. Go find them. I mentioned earlier silphium, the uh, rosin weeds or compass plants. We have a number of species of beard tongue in the genus Pinstemon. A number of species of black-eyed Susans or yellow cone flowers in the genus Rebeccia. We have three species of meadow beauty or Rexia. We have uh, at least a dozen, I think maybe 14 species of native sunflowers. We have five species of native false indigo or Baptisia in the bean and pea family. It's another milkweed there, that's the antelope horn or green milkweed. These are some really rare species that uh, are excellent in the garden. This species is Trelisus larkspur, it's a delphinium, delphinium trelisii. It's only known from a handful of uh, sites in the Ozark Mountains of Missouri and Arkansas. And it occurs there on limestone glades, or dolomite glades, high pH, rocky, glady outcrops. Uh, not hard to grow in the, in the garden, if you live around here, you'd want to add some crushed limestone if you planted it, but uh, I've had good luck with it. Uh, evening rain lily, Cuparia dramundii. The rain lilies are interesting. They, they put up their foliage, do all their photosynthesizing early in the spring. The leaves disappear, and then in the summer you'll have a big rain, and you just walk outside one day, and there they'll all be uh, overnight, just popped up and flowered. Uh, pretty interesting plants. Rare in Arkansas known from the southwestern part of the state, and then the western prairies in the River Valley, and the glades up in uh, northern Arkansas, but very rare. <clears throat> a number of species of aster, very good native plants for some, some like shade, some like sun. I think I've got them out, some good ones outlined in your handout. Now, this is a rare one called the silver aster, or silky aster. It grows in glade, dry, open habitats uh, in the Ozarks and Washingtons. One of my favorite plants is the anything in the genus Silene, especially the red ones. This is uh, fire pink, or this one is a rare one called Royal Catchfly. It's about four feet tall, large pyramid shape uh, arrangements of brilliant red flowers about uh, an inch across. Uh, the plant is sticky to the touch. Uh, wonderful hummingbird plant, really spectacular. Another one of our native uh, beard tongues, this is Pinstemon cobia, the shuli beard tongue. These flowers are three inches long, uh, about an inch across, uh, very showy, long-lived, likes uh, dry, open habitat, a little bit of a high pH. A rare species of echinacea, echinacea paradoxa, the yellow cone flower, only known in the Ozarks, nowhere else in the world. Only occurs in limestone and dolomite glade habitat. But in the garden, it's not picky. Uh, if you have well-drained, open habitat, you can grow this species. They call it paradoxical because it has yellow flowers. All the other echinaceas have pink, purple, or white flowers. It's the only one that's in the oddball uh, great garden plant, B. Uh, poppy mallows, Caloroid bushii, bushes poppy mallow, another rare species. Uh, excellent garden plant for open dry sites. 
<clears throat> this interesting plant is called Rattlesnake Master. It's a uh, native prairie and woodland species. It's about uh, three to four feet tall, has leaves that look like a yucca. The Latin name is Eryngium yuccafolium, which means the yucca-leaved Eryngium. And uh, the Native Americans use this plant for a wide variety of purposes, especially as a fiber plant. And the archaeologists excavated into bluff shelters in the Ozarks. They found moccasins made of the leaves of this tough plant, very tough fibrous, use it to make rope, uh, all manner of, of uh, industrial uh, uses prehistoric. <coughs> a couple more milkweeds. The, the comet milkweed, extremely dry sites, uh, very well drained. And the purple milkweed, likes it a little shadier, a little more moist. It's about four feet tall, big clusters of you know, ball-shaped flower arrangements of purple flowers. This is a shooting star and wild hyacinth at Baker Prairie, both excellent garden plants. <clears throat> we have a whole bunch of native mints, some of them very fragrant, some of them not fragrant at all. Um, one of the showiest is something called Blue Sage, it has big blue flowers, brilliant blue. It's about five feet tall, great back of the border plant. Uh, it's native around here, you may have seen it in open woodlands and roadsides. We get enough sun. Wonderful plant. Another one of the uh, Baptisia is yellow fall indigo, Baptisia sparocarpa, large bush like uh, growth form with big tall spires about this high of just yellow flowers, multiple spires per plant. I call it prairie candles. It's pretty show. This is Middle Fork Barrens, a wonderful uh, glade area I mentioned just over here by Hot Springs Village. This is the highest quality uh, wet shale blade that we know of in Arkansas. It has these spring-fed creeks in the middle of it. Um, very diverse. It's in these glades where you'll find the solution for your extremely dry, rocky, road embankment type uh, sites. Native desert plants here in Arkansas. Things like Yucca Arkansana, the Arkansas bear grass. And we also have two other native yuccas here. We have three native cactus, or cacti here. This is Opuntia humifusa, there's several other ones. They're all kind of low growing, um, sprawling, uh, patch forming cacti. Flowers are yellow or yellow and orange, uh, very showy. And the fruit are purple or maroon. We have some native sedums, three different species in Arkansas. Some of them are annual, some of them are pretty. One of them is pretty. Uh, we also have some really interesting succulent plants called rock pinks or fame flowers. And um, there, there are several around, including at least one that uh, I'm working on right now with some uh, other researchers from from out of state that appear to be undescribed. These species have, have never, they don't have a name really. They're uh, new species, you know, they're just being uh, understood for the first time in these glade habitats. But these have, uh, they're like the camels of the plant world. They store water in these thick succulent uh, leaves and they bloom, and they grow in no soil at all, just broken rock. And uh, it's granite here and uh, shale here, two different species. And uh, they bloom at different times of day. So I walk across the glades at Middle Fort Barrens one time about 11 o'clock in the morning. None of them blooming. Went down to the river, ate my lunch, spent about an hour down there looking for plants. Walked back across the glade, and everywhere you see it's just hot pink as far as you can see. They all open right in, in the early afternoon on a sunny day. Uh, we have a number of native verbena or vervain species. This is the uh, rose vervain, rose verbena, and our shale blades. Blooms uh, in the garden, it can bloom for several months in the spring and again several months in the fall. Compass plant. Really interesting rare plant that I would like to see uh, make it into the trade. This is something called Nuttall's Pleat Leaf or Celestial Lily. 
It's found only in the Ozarks and Washita's and in the Arkansas River Valley in between. It's in the iris family. And the flowers are about an inch and a half across, and they only open for a few hours in the evening. <coughs> and I mean, they may open, the plant may bloom for a couple of weeks straight, but it, the flowers open right about 6 o'clock. And Middle Fork Barrens is where um, this photo was taken. There's actually the largest population we know of in the state, perhaps in the world, and um, the thousands of them. And when you catch it blooming, and they all open up, these little green insects, I don't know if they're bee mimics or fly, you know, if they're uh, bees or bee mimics, very small metallic green hovering insects, and they come all out and they get all over them, all right at 6.15 in the evening. And the plants are really interesting. You can watch them open. They open over the space of just a few minutes. You can watch them unfurl, open up, and the, the female flower parts, the pistils are here at the base, the little star. And then the stamens stick up, out from the middle. And they sit like that for the first hour or so. And these insects are flying around, so they're trying to, they're given an opportunity to cross-pollinate. However, if they, if they don't cross-pollinate, these stamens will curl up and bring themselves down in the second hour that they're open and come into contact with the stigmas and fertilize themselves. And I've never seen one that didn't make a seed bud. They're very rare in the wild. They're very habitat specific to these glades. But uh, you know, I'm, I'm trying to, I've gathered seed, I'm gonna try to grow some. Hopefully we can get this thing uh, in the gardens. That's the Washington top blue star that I mentioned uh, was the big perennial plant of the year a few years ago. Uh, all the sites uh, in the Washita Mountains, but a few in the Arkansas River Valley here, I uh, only know from Arkansas and Missouri. That's a uh, large one there. That's about three feet across, three feet high. Some more of our mint species. We have a number of monardas. I know the previous speaker mentioned monardas being great uh, insect plants, uh, especially for bees. We have two uh, annual species. The annuals all have the, the flower heads stacked one on top of the other up the stem. And then the perennial species are all different. They just have uh, multiple stems with um, individual flower heads at the tips. This is one of my favorites. It's one of the annuals, the spotted bee balm. Uh, pink and white bracts under the flower heads. And the flowers, uh, individual flowers, are yellow with purple spots. Very showy. It has self-seeds. We've got two native passion flowers. This one is the white form of the purple passion flower. These are about three, sometimes four inches across. Very interesting architecture to the flower. It's a, it's a uh, perennial vine, but it's not woody, so it dies to the ground every year. They're also called maypops. They make an edible fruit. Tastes like lemons. If you're going to get into growing these uh, native plants, a lot of them are uh, becoming available in the trade. There's a few specialty nurseries. I mentioned two that I'm aware of in Arkansas in your handout. Uh, but you'll have access to a much broader uh, selection if you harvest seeds yourself. And I ask you please not to dig native wildflowers up from their natural habitats and bring them into your yard. If you get caught doing it on a state natural area, it'll be in big trouble. Mm -hmm. um, the exception would be if it's going to get destroyed. If there's a site about to have a building put on it, you know, I'm all for salvaging. Um, but these can be grown from seed. I'm going to kind of uh, give you a quick background on how to grow some from seed. Um, you'll need to process your own seed. I think it's fun. If you have kids in your life, they love this. Um, these are pale purple coneflower, Echinacea paladin, which I've shown a lot of times. Um, you can gather these up, just clip the heads off in the fall, uh, bring them in. Got a, that's a one quarter inch mesh screen. Uh, if you have any child labor, you can get them to do a little dance that we call at our house the coneflower stomp. And this dance up and down on the, um, the seed heads, crush them, the seeds fall out, all the chaff or a lot of it will stay up in your screen, uh, and the seeds will fall through. You can run the ones through with your hand that you're having trouble with. Um, 
sort all the different species. You can clean a lot of seeds this way, <clears throat> pretty low tech, and uh, from away. But it's a minority of the native species that you can just sow um, straight out, you know, in the spring and get the things to grow. Most of the things you'll have to do some sort of pre-germination treatment on. And these are things that happen in the wild and in nature on their own, but you can mimic them or speed them up uh, in, in your own uh, garden. Uh, many of the plants, especially those with the really tiny seeds, the little dust-like seeds, they need light in order to germinate. Uh, you want to sow these on a level surface, not on a hillside. Um, don't let it get too dry. Uh, there's some examples of, of some of this kind, the groups of plants that need light. Uh, some species need cold, many of our native species need cold moist stratification. And this of course happens in nature in the winter. Seeds drop in the fall, come into contact with the soil, it's moist, it's cold all winter, it has to go through that cycle to wake up and to germinate. Uh, I do this in the refrigerator, moist sand, not too wet, just, you, know, you don't have water squeezing out of it, but moist sand or peat or vermiculite or something. Put your seeds in there, put them in the refrigerator, depending on the species. You, you can find lots of information online on how to germinate every species you can think of. Uh, some only need 10 days, some need 4 months. And uh, take them out and sow them and germinate. Some need alternating periods of more, moist warm periods and moist cold periods. Uh, a lot of the lilies, a lot of the spring ephemerals need that. Some need two warms in a moist, or two moists in a warm. Uh, these are things that take in nature more than a year to germinate. Same thing. Other species need scarification, or a mechanical abrasion or cutting of the seed coat. Uh, these are things that primarily that would be consumed, passed through an animal in the wild. Uh, a lot of the legumes are this way. And you can take those and rub them with sandpaper, you can boil them in water. For some species, it works just to boil them in water. Uh, other species, you need to nick them with a knife or some of them, braid them in some way. On an industrial scale, a lot of times they'll use acid to do this, like for clover or less or something. They'll you know, treat them in large volumes of seed and acid for a certain number of minutes until it breaks the seed coat. Uh, it's fascinating to try different things and see what works. You might have a batch of seed, not really sure what to do. You do some cold moist, you do some cold moist and scratch them up, etc. And some of the legumes do best if you put a nitrogen fixing bacterium in the soil with them. And there's different species of this rhizobium genus um, that you can get for different plants. You can mail order that from some of the native plant nurseries. Some species have to be planted fresh. And if you have a fleshy fruit, like a rose or a spice bush or um, something that has a you know, flesh coating on it, typically you need to remove that. Some of those have germination inhibitors in them, and in the wild that would be consumed by an animal, and then the, the uh, seed itself would be pooped out. A um, couple of other genera of plants that spectacular. Um, spider warts, it's a whole bunch of different species. Arkansas has more species than any state except for maybe Texas and Alabama or something. I think we have about a dozen or more spider warts. So a lot of great native shrubs like this fringe tree or Grancy Graybeard. We have six native blueberries in Arkansas and one native huckleberry. This is the deerberry one of our native blueberries. These, of course, like all blueberries, like acid soil. They should do well around here. They're probably all over the woods uh, in your area. Lead plant, or the false indigo shrubs, amorpha, beautiful pink, I mean, uh, purple and uh, orange flowers. Some interesting wetland shrubs, like the swamp loosestrife, or floating loosestrife. This is a shrub that floats on the water. Really interesting. It does root down underneath. Uh, sometimes, sometimes it's entirely contained in a floating mat. You may think the flower looks familiar, maybe a little like a crepe though. It's in the same family. We have a great diversity of native ferns. 
Uh, we've got about, there's about 95 firms in Arkansas. I think about 80 of those are native, 85 maybe. Uh, and we have some that like really moist, rich, moist conditions, wet conditions. And we also have desert firms here growing these glades. Full sun, no soil, just out of cracks in the rock. There's a whole group of ferns that are true desert species that we have here in these glades. And they're excellent for uh, rough sites in your house. We got a number of different trilliums. These are some of the spring ephemeral wildflowers. We have a number of native alamutes or hookahs, including this one, which is the Arkansas alamut. It's found in the Washington Mountains at about five sites, and it's much more widespread in the Ozarks, but it occurs nowhere else in the world. It's only in Arkansas. It doesn't even occur in the Missouri Ozarks or in Oklahoma Ozarks, it's only in Arkansas. Beautiful plant, blooms in the fall, has this great foliage. And that's available from some of the native plant nurseries. False bug bane. One site in Arkansas is an Appalachian species of rich, wet seepage areas uh, to the far east. It occurs on one site in the Washington's in Garland County. Indian pink, wonderful moist woodland flower, a number of great lily species. Just a few examples. We have some interesting aquatic plants like this feather foil. Water violet. It's uh, similar to water hyacinth, which is a terrible invasive from South America. Uh, it has this inflated <laughs> stems. It floats up on the water and it has these feather like leaves with the water and under the water and it has little white flowers. So I say it's kind of like uh, water hyacinth. It's nowhere near as, as showy, but uh, it's not a terrible invasive that's going to ruin the aquatic habitat. Uh, we have whole diversity of sedge species. Over 300 species of sedge is native to Arkansas, 135 in the genus Carex alone. Some of these are really remarkable ornamental, have a great ornamental potential, and they occur in all habitats from wet to dry, not just wet <coughs> species. And I'm just gonna kind of end it here, but I um, want to say, if you're interested in, in native species of wildlife, birds, uh, butterflies, bees, any, anything. And they say if you build it, they'll come. And it's really true. When I lived in that house in Little Rock, and I planted those 200 species of wildflowers, I was right in the middle of town, over by uh, the, the stadium where the Razorbacks used to play. Um, <laughs> and, I mean, right in town by the Med Center, if you know where that is. Um, urban area, small house lots, you know, trees around, but, but uh, very much an urban area. And I planted all that stuff, and I started to see all these butterfly species show up that I did not see the first few years I lived there. And uh, one day I was out, and I saw this orange and brown butterfly go over the fence into my backyard, and I said, well, that looks like a Diana Fritillary, which is a state butterfly. It's a rare species, uh, primarily found in nice open wooden habitats well away from town. I said, I can't be what it was, and I ran inside and got my book and went out and camera. And sure enough, this guy in the freeway in the middle of Little Rock had found my yard. So that's, you know, just just goes to show. And that's uh, butterfly milkweed, uh, squeakiest tuberous. And then I ended there with this fire pit. <laughs> yeah. Thanks a lot for having me.